Well, good afternoon, and I hope everybody had a nice weekend, and to, to all the mothers across the Commonwealth, a belated happy Mother's Day. Today I want to talk about Northern Virginia's regional pace to ease restrictions, Petersburg's water, the DMV, and our elections here in the Commonwealth. First, we reported doing 9,801 tests yesterday, which is a great step as we work to ramp up testing. That hasn't shown up on the BDH data website yet, but it will in the next day or two. Now I want to give Virginians an update on where we are with our data metrics. You saw these slides on Friday, and they are also available on the Virginia Department of Health website. This is our confirmed positive cases by the date they were reported to the Virginia Department of Health. The blue bar represents the number of cases and the yellow line is the seven day moving average. While we've seen a slight dip in the past few days, largely these numbers are going up and that's what we expect to see. This graph shows us how many people are being tested each day in the blue bars. The yellow line represents a seven-day moving average of how many people we are testing. As you can see, both the number of tests and the average of tests performed have both largely been trending upward. There are some dips where we have tested fewer people on the day, but overall this shows that we are doing more testing. This slide shows us how many of those tests come back positive. The dark blue graph is the number of people tested. The light blue at the bottom is how many were positive. And the yellow line again shows the average. I have said I want a 14 day downward trend in the percent of positivity and that is what we continue to see on this chart. This slide shows how many hospitals are reporting shortages of PPE. The blue bars are the number of hospitals and the yellow line is the seven day moving average. This is trending downward, which is good news. It has been several days since any hospitals reported shortages of PPE and right now even the trend is at zero. Our adequate supply of PPE and swabs are two of the factors allowing us to test more. I might also mention that uh, we have a warehouse here in Virginia of PPE and our uh, supply, our stock on hand is, is uh, doing well and looking better every day. We're monitoring our hospital capacity to take patients. On this chart, the darkest blue at the bottom is how many COVID patients are in hospital beds. The medium blue is how many other patients are in beds. And the light blue is their staffed bed capacity. The yellow line, the dotted line at the top represents surge capacity. As you can see, our hospitals are currently reporting that they have capacity and we will watch that now that hospitals are doing more elective surgeries than in the past. This chart shows us how many people who have COVID are hospitalized. The total number is the dark blue bar, while the medium blue represents COVID patients in the ICU, and the light blue is COVID patients on ventilators. The yellow line is a seven-day average. Our ventilator capacity remains adequate at about 20%. As I've said, it's important that the Commonwealth as a whole can meet the metrics that we've laid out before moving into phase one. But I also recognize that we live in a diverse Commonwealth and different regions face different challenges. That's why the phase one restrictions are a floor, but not a ceiling. While no region may move faster to ease restrictions, we're open to some regions moving more slowly. I have been speaking regularly with officials in Northern Virginia about this very issue. I asked them to send us a formal letter 
outlining that they are unified in requesting a delay. Uniformity across the region is critical to a successful strategy rather than having restrictions piecemeal across towns or counties. Northern Virginia localities sent me that letter over the weekend, and I appreciate the continued cooperation between our administration and these local governments. We all want a responsible, data-driven, health-focused approach. Northern Virginia health officials are using the same metrics that we're using for the state, percent positivity, hospitalizations, testing and tracing capacity, hospital beds, and PPE. So I'd like to walk you through the ways those metrics look a bit different in Northern Virginia than they do in the rest of our state. As we've said repeatedly, the number of cases alone doesn't give us an accurate picture of the disease, but we can make some comparisons across regions. And Northern Virginia consistently has a significant portion of our cases statewide. In the past 24 hours, for example, Northern Virginia reported more than 700 cases. The rest of Virginia reported fewer than 300. We see similar differences in percent positivity. Both Northern Virginia and the rest of the Commonwealth are seeing declines in the percent of tests that are positive, which is a good thing. But we see big differences in the percentages. On this slide, you'll see Northern Virginia has about a 25% positivity rate. And on this slide, you'll see the rest of the Commonwealth is closer to 10%. So again, while the trend of percent positives is coming down in both Northern Virginia and throughout the rest of the Commonwealth, the percent positives is much higher in Northern Virginia at 25% than it is at the rest of the Commonwealth at 10%. Again, the same can be said about hospitalizations. In Northern Virginia, COVID patients make up a significantly larger portion of the region's hospital bed capacity, as you'll see in this slide. COVID hospitalizations are the darkest blue area at the bottom. And this slide, of course, shows COVID hospitalizations in the rest of the state. Again, the dark blue area at the bottom. We will continue to work with those officials on a slower phase one. And we expect that some local officials will join us for this briefing on Wednesday to explain how this will work. The key to all of this is testing. This weekend, testing went on in a variety of localities, as you can see from the pictures in these slides. For example, there were drive-through testing sites in the New River Valley, as well as community testing on the Eastern Shore, and we are targeting testing at our at-risk neighborhoods. I'm going to ask Dr. Janice Underwood, our Chief Diversity Officer, to come up to speak about our efforts to increase testing and to provide masks, hand sanitizer, and information in underserved communities. Dr. Underwood, welcome. Thank you, Governor. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Janice Underwood, and I am Governor Northam's Chief Diversity Officer. The Health Equity Task Force provides leadership to the Unified Command Health Equity Working Group, which was proactively established at the onset of Virginia's COVID-19 response on March 11th. The purpose of the task force and the working group is to serve as the Commonwealth's first ever coalition during an emergency response to unapologetically ensure a health equity lens is applied to all decision making within Virginia's response. The task force meets twice every day and the working group meets every Tuesday to, re to review policies, provide real time learning opportunities, review communication campaigns, and to ensure small women and minority businesses are leveraged in the response and recovery. 
I lead the Health Equity Leadership Task Force and Sable K. Nelson, Acting Director of the Office of Health Equity at the Virginia Department of Health, serves as the chair of the Health Equity Working Group, which is a combination of several state agencies and private human service agencies, faith leaders, and community leaders. One of the priorities of the Equity Task Force is to collaborate with local governments to provide support to vulnerable communities because we know that everyone does not enjoy the same privileges for social or physical distancing or receive information the same way. Therefore, the task force provides localities access to health equity training for all city employees and volunteers, personal protective equipment or PPE, culturally appropriate educational materials to support diverse communities, and, that, and those materials are in all languages identified as being needed, and support in identifying neighborhoods at elevated risk with mapping technology. The Health Equity Leadership Task Force is comprised of myself, Curtis Brown, and Dr. Lauren Powell of the Virginia Department of Emergency Management, uh, Sable K. Nelson, as I mentioned, from the Virginia Department of Health, and Ms. Alacia Black Hackett from my office. The Health Equity Working Group is a larger body, as I mentioned, comprised of all the community stakeholders, such as state agencies, private human service agencies, and faith leaders and community leaders. So what we know for sure is that local and national data indicate COVID-19 is exerting a disproportionate impact on communities of color and African American, Hispanic, Latino, or Latinx, and indigenous communities in particular. So in order to mitigate the projected debilitating outcomes on the African American community and these other communities who are at elevated risk, we've made 20,000 masks, 20,000 bottles of hand sanitizer available to Richmond City for distribution to its most under-resourced communities. Social distancing doesn't uh, mean forgetting our need for community engagement, community relationship, and community connection. So the Richmond Pilot is only the first of many initiatives that the Equity Task Force aims to lead throughout the Commonwealth. We recognize the pilot will not address all the needs of the communities we've identified, but we are hopeful that this is a model to ensure other resources make it to their doorsteps as well. Thank you. Dr. Underwood and to the Health Equity uh, Task Force, thanks for all of the great work that you all are doing. I really, on behalf of Virginia, really appreciate it. We continue to increase our testing capacity, as you are seeing, and I expect to have some announcements, some really exciting announcements about testing partnerships in the coming days. So stay tuned for that. And what, what we're going to talk about is, is our ability to work with some of the retail uh, stores across Virginia to, to have a lot more community testing, uh, not only in, in metropolitan areas, but really throughout Virginia and in uh, all of our zip codes. So I think that's something that we'll really be able to look forward to. Last week, we talked about the fact that Petersburg has some residents whose water had been shut off. I said then that it is unacceptable to have residents without access to running water when protection against this virus relies heavily on the ability to wash hands and other services. So yesterday, Dr. Norm Oliver, our health commissioner issued a public health certification that prevents the city of Petersburg from shutting off water service to any occupied dwelling and requires the city to restore service to 46 homes. Restoring water service will help protect those households as well as the community. Now moving to the Department of Motor Vehicles. We closed our public facing DMV offices early in this pandemic. I am extending that closure for at least the next week. Online services remain open. And I uh, would remind Virginians that this is a difficult time for our graduating seniors. Um, they are not being able to enjoy a lot of the things that all of us have enjoyed. There are also some high school students who uh, have met all the requirements to obtain their driver's license. 
and I remember how much I looked forward to getting my driver's license when I was 16. So I would just ask all of you to be patient. We are working through this. We will get our DMVs up and running as soon as we can and, and be able to get your, your driver's license to you. So I appreciate your patience. And finally, more than 50 of our localities have local elections coming up on May the 19th. Tomorrow, May the 12th, Tomorrow, May the 12th, is the last day for voters to request an absentee ballot be mailed to you. I strongly encourage everyone to vote absentee by mail. You can mark reason 2A, it also we'll have beside it, my disability or illness on the form. Voting by mail is secure and is the safest way to vote at this time. We will continue working to make sure our physical polling places and poll workers are as safe as possible for those who do go out to vote in person. Now we'll hear an update from Dr. Oliver, and then we'll be glad to take your questions. Dr. Oliver, thank you. Well, thank you, Governor. Just a quick update on the uh, numbers that appeared on the uh, VDH website uh, earlier today. We now stand at a total number of cases of 25,070 cases. Uh, that is 989 new cases in the last 24-hour reporting period. Deaths now stand at 850. That's an increase of 11. And we have total tests of 167,758 uh, tests, and that represents, as the governor said, now 9,000. 801 tests in the last uh, reporting period. So that's a good thing that that's been uh, increasing. Um, the number of cases in the African American uh, community continues to be disproportionately high at about 24% of the cases. Uh, we reported uh, 4,119 cases in the last uh, 24 hour period. Um, and not in the last. That's the total now. And the total uh, for the uh, Latinx uh, community stands at 6,894, which again, as I reported uh, last week, is about 40% of the cases. And I believe that's because of um, the outbreaks that we've seen in a bunch of the uh, poultry plants in, in the uh, region. Those outbreaks have been um, trending uh, down. The number of cases has uh, been coming down as we've um, put a lot of attention into dealing with those and the uh, and we're also looking at the community spread in those areas with big tests in uh, both the um, Harrisonburg area and on the Eastern Shore where we've collected thousands of tests in the last couple of days. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Be glad to take your questions. Hi, Governor. Hi. Um, so, Dr. Remley was brought in three weeks ago to try to ramp up the testing rate, and I keep checking the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus uh, Resource Center to see where we rank compared to other states, and we're still at the bottom. So I'm wondering uh, why that is. A lot of our viewers keep reaching out wanting to know why is our testing rate so low compared to other states. Yeah, I think we've tried to explain that in, on a, in a number of uh, uh, press conferences. Um, I will tell you that I don't have the slide in front of us today, but uh, I don't know if you remember the slide that showed the five stages um, and that I told you that as quickly as we can, uh, we would get up to 10,000. Uh, today we were at 9,801, which is 199 tests uh, from uh, 10,000. And so I'm very pleased with the progress we're making. Um, I know a lot of folks compare to other states. Uh, there perhaps are some variables, different factors, uh, but uh, the team has been working very hard, and I'm going to let Dr. Remley uh, address the, the question as well, but I think you'll see that uh, with the adequate PPE that we have now, uh, the adequate testing supplies, uh, particularly the, the swabs, that uh, both of which governors have really been uh, having short supply and competing for. There's been not a whole lot of guidance coming from uh, Washington uh, in, in that regard, but uh, we've been able to ramp up those supplies and, 
and uh, that's allowed us to do a, a significant amount more testing. Um, and then I think you'll hear uh, in the coming days, as I just said, that uh, we have some great uh, working relationships with our retailers uh, across Virginia, um, and we will be making some announcements of how we will have uh, not only testing where people can walk up and have the test, but, but also drive-through testing as well. So, um, again, I, I, uh, I make no excuses for Virginia. I think we're in a good place. Um, and uh, as we move forward, uh, one of the abilities to go into phase one, uh, and you've heard me say this a, a number of times before as well, is that we need to have the adequate PPE, we need to have the adequate uh, testing capability, and, and uh, it gets better every day, and, and that's one of the things that's allowing us to, to move forward with our, our going into phase one. So, Karen, any additional comments? Sure. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. So um, the Johns Hopkins is a cumulative amount of test, so we will never catch up unless we inappropriately just tested everybody in the state, which wouldn't give us information that would help with public health. So if you look at what do we need to know for public health, the 10,000 was looking at about 3% of the population. If you look at 2 to 4%, you know, 2% is around 5,500 a day, 4% is a little bit more than 10,000. That's when the best models, the best people that inform Dr. Peak and Dr. Oliver and the governor say, that's where you need to be with testing writ large for the state to be able to make good decisions about opening up, about health care needs, and where we're going to go. We are, if not today there, we're there in the next couple of days. That will provide a lot more important public health information. In addition, we're really focusing on making sure, as the governor said, that we're taking care of the uninsured and underinsured, the vulnerable populations we don't always see or find. It's through free clinics who care for those people from the federally qualified health centers, but also as we have more testing capacity by being able to deploy our medical reserve corps, our guard, our health department's test kits and capacity are no longer an issue. So they're identifying different groups around the state, faith-based organizations, community centers, places they can go, they know their communities really well, and test there. In the next coming days, I think we'll be able to share with you how we're doing, because it's all continuous quality improvement, right, for all of us. How are we doing in every district? So we know we're testing more in Northern Virginia, as the governor said, because there's a lot of disease in Northern Virginia. But we want to assure people across the state that we're doing enough testing in their zip code, in their district, so they can be reassured that the number of cases represent what the disease looks like in that community. To me, that's our end state. And if we can reassure everybody in the state that their area, we know how much disease there is there, we know how to take care of that, we know what the healthcare system can do, we know what public health has to do, then we've reached the right numbers. Will we ever be at the top of the list for Johns Hopkins? I don't think it's an attainable goal and not one we should work for. We should be working for getting the right public health information to the governor and all of the leaders so they can make the important decisions they need to make. Thank you. Question will be from Max Thornberry with the Northern Virginia Daily. Hi, Governor. Uh, I've got a question about the, the context of the statistics that we're seeing. Um, some people are wondering why officials aren't talking about the COVID statistics in terms of statewide population. We're talking about the number of people that are tested, but it's not really being compared to how many people are in the state. Uh, and are the rates per 100,000 that BDH is reporting the best indicator of the pervasiveness of the virus in the state? And also, how many people do the state's models project are are positive for every one case that we can test? I know that early on that number was, I think it was around uh, 10 people were assumed to be positive for every one case that we had. Has that figure changed? Um, Lori, did you want to tackle that? I'm sure I've tracked all those questions. <laughs> yeah. But I can try. Well, why don't you try I asked Lori to do it because she, um, Dr. Falano was the state epidemiologist before Dr. Peak. So. so I'll try to repeat those questions back because there were several. Uh, I believe the first one was about uh, our reporting numbers per 100,000 population. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, yes. I, I was curious about numbers being reported in terms of statewide population and whether the rates per 100,000 are the best way 
to understand the pervasiveness of the virus in terms of statewide population. Yeah, so I think that the question to that is that at VDH and every state health department around the country, we're looking at lots of different uh, lenses, and that is one good measure of disease uh, burden. But we combine that, obviously, with all of the other metrics that were displayed today because it's important to look at the whole picture, not just a case count, not just the number of persons in a hospital at any you know, given moment, but the trends and the whole picture of data together. So yes, that, the short answer is yes, that's, um, that's one way that we look at this. I, need, I needed a, a pen to write all that down. Yeah, Sorry. <laughs> Can you repeat the last part of your question again? Yes. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, so early on, there were models for every one case that the state could say, mm -hmm. yes, we have a confirmed case. We think that there are mm -hmm. X number of other cases that are also positive. Uh, what is that number right, right now? I'm not sure I know the specific, do you know that? The, the R not. So no, not the R not. You're asking of, of every uh, one case, um, the projections as to how many cases that actually represents. Um, I'm not sure I have the answer to that right now. whether the state is going to bring in McKinsey or another third-party site to help expand testing in the same way that McKinsey helped expand PPE, and then what they'll be able to deliver that the testing task force cannot. Um, and then, sorry, double question. You've also said before that, um, you know, there were risks if the state was not opened altogether that folks from hot spots could travel to areas with lower number of cases and cause new transmissions. So if Northern Virginia opens later, will there be restrictions to keep people from that hot spot traveling to other areas of the state? The, let me answer the second part, and then I think my chief is going to answer the, the first part. The, and the, the second part of uh, Kate's question was if there are areas that uh, are uh, uh, more, have more prevalence uh, and we uh, don't allow them to go into phase one, will those individuals be traveling to other parts of the state? And we would certainly encourage them in this case not to, Kate. Uh, I think one of the things that has gone into the decision making uh, with Northern Virginia, and again, we're uh, in daily communication with them, is the relationship with Maryland and Washington, D.C. And, and so if you look at the statistics, the data, the number of cases, the percent positives, um, the, that whole area is, is so dense and, and they're all kind of sharing the same challenges. And so that was a lot that, that went into the decision making and, and is going into the decision making of, of when they'll be able to go into to phase one was the ability to work with our, our neighbors. But um, I would certainly, I mean, just uh, the answer to your question, I would encourage individuals uh, if they are uh, in areas where there's a higher prevalence to, to really be uh, uh, cognizant of the things that we know that work for everybody, and that's the, the stay-at-home order, the the uh, the hand washing, the, the social distance, and all of these things are so important until the numbers start to go down. So, um, so while we're we're not restricting them from uh, from traveling uh, elsewhere, we would certainly encourage them to to uh, maintain the, the same guidelines that we've been talking about all along, Chief. Uh, Clark Mercer, the governor's chief of staff. I'm going to follow up a little bit on the governor's answer and then also address the, the need for extra capacity with, uh, with tracing and our testing. You know, we talk a lot about how the virus does not obey uh, political borders, and I think the governor articulated we're next to Maryland and D.C. We're also border Tennessee, West Virginia, and Kentucky. And you look at all those states, and they're all doing something a little bit different with their phase one. So, for example, a lot has been written about Bristol, a half of Bristol's in Tennessee, half is in Virginia. So we've got that issue of folks migrating to different areas all across the Commonwealth. What makes, I think, uh, Northern Virginia unique, Fairfax County alone is bigger than eight states in the country. And that's, that's pretty remarkable when you think about that. And the five jurisdictions that sent the governor a letter this weekend was Fairfax County, Prince William, Alexandria, Arlington, and Loudoun. 
and then there are some cities and towns within those jurisdictions that followed up with a follow-up letter. Um, those five jurisdictions yesterday accounted for 719 new positive tests. That's 73 percent of all the new tests in the Commonwealth. The rest of Virginia accounted for 270, or 27 percent. Um, the rest of Virginia accounts for 60 percent of the population. So it's, it's gotten to the point where if you step back and look at the Commonwealth as, as a set of regions that outside of Northern Virginia has, has hit those metrics. And I think a responsible phase one approach, uh, which is what the governor has articulated, is going to keep somebody from Alexandria to drive to Southwest Virginia to avail themselves of outdoor dining or a haircut. It's not like we're flipping the light switch and throwing everything open right away. And a lot of the large venues, a lot of the large gatherings are, are still going to be further down the road in phase two and phase three. The 10 person ban is still in effect for gatherings. I think that's going to keep people from, uh, from gathering in large crowds. And it's a safer at home order with our folks who are elderly and, and vulnerable being strongly encouraged to stay at home. So I think that will mitigate uh, that type of travel. The, the first question you had is, are we looking to you know, third party vendors to help us with testing and with tracing? And the answer is absolutely yes. I mean, we've heard from hundreds of companies and uh, consultants that specialize in whether it's uh, assisting with unemployment insurance, whether it's assisting with tracing, or whether it's assisting with, uh, with testing. And in talking to other states, I don't think there's a state that's doing this by themselves. Uh, the tracing program has to ramp up over 1,000 new hires pretty quickly uh, in a tough environment. Obviously, there's folks that are uh, receiving unemployment benefits, and uh, we are competing with those benefits to get them into a community tracing program. So um, you mentioned one specific firm, but we've talked to many, many firms and are evaluating them, and our health folks will make the best decision working with finance, and, and that will be leveraged using the CARES Act's dollars. So that will be coming directly from Washington, the monies we put against tracing and testing. And so no, no contact yet as far as contact with tracing? Uh, I believe we're close to executing a contract or two for tracing, but we have not yet. Thanks. The next question will be from Taylor Coleman with WSET in Lynchburg. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, my question is, now, while the state is under its current restrictions and people are out of work, a lot of folks are having issues getting through to the Virginia Economic Commission um, in order to file for unemployment. Is there a timeline for getting more staff in place to help combat that high volume of requests? I have Dr. Healy, who's making her way to the podium and has been working on that very issue, so she will address that. Dr. Healy, thank you. Great. The question is about the Virginia Employment Commission and what we've done to increase staff to make sure that everyone can get their particular benefits. We've actually, uh, one of the, during the recession, we had about 1,600 people working at the Virginia Employment Commission. In February, we had 800. So pretty much half, and we, these numbers are a whole lot more than we saw during the Great Recession. And so we've done anything we can to staff. We have two uh, call centers that we actually, by federal law, we couldn't contract with. We had to have our own staff. And so they released that. So we have two call centers that are coming on board. We have one in Newport News, and then we expanded our office in Grundy to additional uh, call center. And then we've increased about 100 people into our headquarters. So we're working as hard as we can uh, to make sure that everyone has their benefits, and this would be for our call centers, as well as we've also increased our online capability. So if you're still having problems with unemployment, uh, make sure you try that online form first. We have two different programs online that you have to go through, but then we also have uh, more capacity in our call centers. Thanks, May. If you're able to um, begin rolling back some of the restrictions on Friday, can you talk a little bit about where you stand on the contract tracing workforce and on any workforce you'd need for isolating people who are infected if, if you're also on track to ramp that up in time? So the question was really about uh, where we are with regard to uh, tracing workforce. And we started uh, pre-COVID-19 at the Virginia Department of Health with uh, 200 or, or so uh, tracers. Um, and obviously, th these folks have multiple roles, but that's the, 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 uh, the number. And actually, since the beginning of this, the, the department has staffed up to uh, over 600. So that's a significant improvement already, uh, and that is helping right now. Now, we have additional, we want to get to that 
uh, additional uh, 1,000 in terms of tracers and 200 in terms of the, the, uh, the supervisory folks with public health experience. So um, we're uh, well on our way and uh, we, uh, we will aggressively uh, uh, um, ramp, up, ramp up over the next several weeks to, uh, to, in order to, to meet those goals. Meet the rolling back of restrictions that could begin Friday. Well, we've got. Uh, I mean, over as we said, over over 600, and the hiring experience will be over the next uh, two to four weeks to get an additional 500, and then in June an additional 300 to get to 800 new to get us to where we need to be in that uh, 15 to somewhat more than 15 per hundred thousand. So. Um, we do have increased capacity, but we also need to increase it further. Next up is Tracy Agnew with the Suffolk News Herald. Thank you. My question is whether you have considered a mask order as part of the phased approach to reopening. Was the question of mask? Uh huh. Um, we have considered it, uh, as you know, in the. Uh, non-essential retails, uh, for example, restaurants, we are requiring them to uh, wear masks, uh, but we are encouraging it otherwise. And uh, we'll, again, continue as we move forward, as we look at the numbers, um, as we look at the uh, making sure that our, our Virginians, our, our patrons moving into these places of business are comfortable, that's certainly something that we'll consider. But right now, uh, we're encouraging the use of facial protection. Some restaurants who are perplexed by this outdoor seating requirement only and a lot of them don't understand why retailers are allowed to open with indoor capacity but not restaurants so what do you say to people who overall think that these requirements are contradictory in some ways and then also we've heard a lot about the tentative may 15th date mm -hmm. um, but when will we know for sure so that businesses can plan given that we're less than a week out yeah, may 15th is the second part of your question when will we know for sure and um, I suspect uh, if, if nothing changes that I'll, I'll make a, uh, uh, a ruling, if you will, on, on Wednesday. Uh, but I, I will tell you, uh, Jackie, that um, uh, if our numbers continue to trend uh, in, in the direction they are, especially for areas uh, uh, of Virginia uh, that we, we talked about today, um, other, aside from Northern Virginia, uh, that I anticipate that we will go into phase one on, on Friday. And repeat, if you don't mind, your first part of your question. That's fine. I'm just saying that we've heard from a lot of restaurants and Thank organizations you. representing that are perplexed say that the guidelines are contradictory. Can you respond? Yeah, the question is, uh, uh, Jackie said that she's heard from some restaurant owners that think that the guidelines are, are inconsistent. And I would just repeat, Jackie, that uh, this is a, a phase. Um, we're going into to phase one, then phase two, phase three. Um, we are hopeful uh, that, uh, that phase one will last no more than, than two to three weeks. And, and a lot of the decision on the restaurants was it, it falls back to people being comfortable uh, going into that restaurant, knowing that they're um, going to be safe. Um, and also for employees of restaurants. So, so a lot of the, the discussion that we had with our business task group uh, included restaurant owners, and again, I would just have, tell everybody uh, across Virginia uh, that uh, this is for two to three weeks. Uh, they are allowed to, to serve outdoors at 50% capacity. Um, it, I think it will allow for individuals to get back into those restaurants to be comfortable, and if everything goes well over those two to three weeks, then we will hopefully, uh, our phase two will, will be indoor dining uh, at 50% capacity. Uh, no standing at bars, uh, tables six feet apart. Uh, all of these have been recommendations that have come through the, the business task group. Yeah, next, is Al next is Alan Suderman with the Associated Press. Yeah, hello. Thanks for taking my call. Um, Governor, did you intervene in the case of Vincent Martin and the parole board? And if so, um, why? And have any other recent parole decisions been put on hold? And one other question, um, do you have a ballpark estimate for how long Northern Virginia would delay going into uh, phase one and when you would um, when you would make those plans public? 
Two questions, Alan. I appreciate both of them. Um, the second one I'm going to answer, uh, and then I'm going to allow our Secretary of Public Safety to uh, address the parole issue. Um, the second question was how long will Northern Virginia delay going into phase one? And, and that's to be determined. Uh, that's really to to uh, allow us time to, to follow those trends, uh, to follow the percent positivity, uh, to follow the hospitalizations, which are, as you saw from the graphs, are a little bit higher in Northern Virginia uh, than they are in other parts of Virginia. So, so we'll work closely with them. Um, it's been a, I would just tell you, I, I commend the leadership in, in Northern Virginia, uh, the local officials, the, the delegates, the senators, they've all been involved in this. And this is about the health and well-being of Virginians. And I couldn't ask for a better relationship. Uh, they have uh, just chosen to be part of the solution. And as soon as they feel comfortable and we feel comfortable collectively moving to phase one, we'll certainly do that. And, and I would also say that, that they are just as anxious as the rest of us, as the rest of you are across Virginia to, to ease these restrictions and to, again, uh, return to as nor near normal as we can, but they're, they're not there yet. And I appreciate their, their concerns. And, and again, we will continue to work with them. And just as soon as we feel that it's safe uh, for uh, Virginians in Northern Virginia to, to venture out into these uh, places of business, we'll, we'll uh, work with them to move into phase one. Uh, Secretary Moran, thanks. Governor, thank you. The question has to do with the case of Vincent Martin's parole. Uh, he was convicted killing Richmond police officer Michael Connors back in 1979. Parole board uh, some weeks ago uh, determined he was eligible for parole and granted his parole of 40 years uh, of, of serving his sentence. Uh, fast forward to today, I believe the uh, parole board has uh, determined to put that case on hold, put his relate, release on hold. Uh, we have a new uh, chair of the parole board, Tanya Chapman, and uh, there have been a number of concerns raised by the Connors family, by the Richmond Police Department, by the local Commonwealth's attorney. And um, because of those, I believe uh, there has now been a uh, independent investigation begun and as reported by a local television station last week, uh, parole board became aware of it. And in light of an independent investigation into the process by which the parole board made that determination, they have determined to uh, put it on hold temporarily. This will allow the removal of the cloud that has formed over this parole decision. Uh, there have been a number of allegations made and and an independent review will, will allow the parole board and Mr. Martin and the family and the Richmond PD to move on after uh, that to, uh, independent investigation is concluded. Are any other cases affected by that? Uh, the question is, are other decisions? I believe it's the Vincent Martin case that uh, has drawn a particular amount of attention, uh, Alan, and uh, it is a temporary hold until that OSIG investigation is completed. Other cases, again, the OSIG investigation is supposed to be confidential, so uh, I, I don't know exactly all of the details. Uh, the parole board, as you know, worked furiously to respond to the COVID crisis. Uh, there were a number of releases during the month of March, but there were also a number of reviews as a percentage of, of releases, it was not extraordinary. I mean, they just reviewed an extraordinary number of cases. They rejected over 80% of the cases they reviewed, but because they worked so diligently, they reviewed probably about three times as many cases as they normally would. Um, and we, you know, we're all interested in making sure the processes were followed, certainly in terms of victim notification, that's very important to the parole board, it's very important to this administration. We want to make sure uh, that the process was followed, but um, you know that particular case brings a great deal of attention, and, and I think uh, the extraordinary action by the parole board uh, is limited to this particular case. Yeah, um, yeah uh, VDH on Friday said that the um, daily testing numbers include anybody testing, and as you know, 
those haven't been vetted yet and there are concerns about their validity. Can you talk about why those numbers are included, confirm that they are, um, and tell us when we might see those separated? Um, and then a second brief question for the governor is just, I know that we're working really hard on testing and on contact tracing, but do you feel like we're at a capacity where we won't see cases spike or increase when we start reopening on Friday? Uh, the first question is um, uh, the Virginia Department of Health counts among the tests that are um, performed here, the serologic uh, test that looks at uh, antigens and antibodies, uh, and why did we do that? Um, we made a decision to uh, count all tests as, and changed our methodology from um, just looking at the unique people who were being tested. Um, and um, the uh, in general, when we do um, our uh, data reporting, we attempt to follow the guidelines that are provided to us by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, around this issue of whether or not to count serologic tests, there, are, there is no set guidance on that, and so you will find variability among the states on how that gets reported. We chose to report all the tests that were being uh, performed. Um, and um, at short of doing a survey of all the states to find out who is uh, doing it the way we're doing it versus uh, some other way, I, I, I don't, I can't tell you that there is some particular reason that um, one state would choose to do it one way or the uh, or the other. Uh, we, uh, the question is, uh, uh, could we separate out the uh, serologic tests from the um, molecular tests? Um, I, I believe that there may be ways to, uh, to do that, and we can certainly uh, look into that um, uh, in the same way that we've separated out unique people tested from um, total, uh, total tests. The second part of your question, that, um, excuse me, Mel, but it sounds like it was a repeat of the first question, is why did we decide to do it? And given that health researchers... Given that what? Some health researchers have suggested that... Um, As I said, there's no national guidance, so some health researchers have suggested that, and others are, are doing what we're doing, which is counting all the tests. So. But uh, perhaps someone else would like to address it. Yeah, I'll just uh, say that... Um, Okay, we started with just the PCR test, and then uh, that was the dominant uh, test, and, and when serologic tests were added, um, uh, they were added to the, again, the idea that it was to survey all the tests we could about this disease. In, in retrospect, we, we may have chosen a, a different path. Uh, without guidance, we, we went for uh, uh, as much testing as, as represented in the community. So. Uh, Going forward, we'll, we'll uh, uh, look into how to untangle, untangle those and uh, uh, more to come. Mel, I think it's important. I mean, we do these pressers three times a week, and, and this question certainly comes up from, from the press every single time we get in front of you, and it's written about extensively. So I have asked our team, and I had suspicions and continue to about whether or not all states are reporting uniformly, because if we're going to be compared to all 50 states, I want to make sure it's apples to apples. And so our team did the same thing you did, which is talk to the Johns Hopkins and the Harvards of the world, and it became clear that other states are including serological testing. So if you're going to compare us to other states and be critical of the, the volume of tests that we're doing, and we are not actually comparing apples to apples, uh, I think that's grossly unfair, and I think there's a way in the back end for us to parse those two types of tests out, but if another state is including serological tests and they're ranked above Virginia and we are not, and we're getting criticized for that, it, it, we, you can't win either way. Now we are including them and our ranking will be better and we're being criticized. So it's, you know, we want to be consistent with how other states are uh, accommodating their tests. And so I think that's the, the goal here is to make sure that these tests are valid and the data is comparing apples to apples. On the, the first question about being ready for this uh, Friday, 
And Greg, this is a follow-up to your question about the, the tracing. I think the governor has, has made it pretty clear and we'll have guidance coming out uh, through uh, our council and, and most likely the vehicle will be an amended EO. But when you take Northern Virginia out of the mix, if they are permitted and allowed to not enter phase one this Friday, when you look at our contact tracers and our testing for the rest of the, the Commonwealth, I think we're more than ready for the rest of the Commonwealth to enter phase one. Where we're going to have to really ramp up some of our contact tracing is where we have the preponderance of positive tests, which is in Northern Virginia. So it stands to reason that if they are delayed by a week or two weeks or several weeks, then we do have a bit of a cushion to get the tracers in Northern Virginia and ready when they are ready to enter phase one. Mel, you had a second part to your question. Uh, have your questions been answered adequately, or is there something that I could uh, try to add? <laughs> we'll do um, one more on the phone and then one more in the room. The question will be from Luann Wright with the Roanoke Times. Um, yes, last week uh, there was a lot of talk about the point prevalence surveys at the nursing homes, um, which will tell you about the illness at a particular day. And so I was wondering, are you going to provide information as to what you're learning from these surveys as to the number of tests that are given, the number of nursing homes or assisted living facilities, and the number of positives so we can have a better understanding of the disease prevalence? And um, a second question, because everyone seems to be getting one, um, are you also considering doing uh, routine universal testing at these facilities such as Maryland is proposing to do? Hi, the, the question is around our point prevalence surveys and if we can provide more information about where those surveys are taking place. I can certainly provide that in upcoming briefings as to the number of point prevalence surveys we've conducted by setting. Uh, while the majority of them to date have been in long-term care facilities, we're also doing uh, providing that service in other settings like workplaces uh, and correctional facilities as well when it's warranted. Um, we would not be providing uh, uh, facility-specific case counts, for example, uh, but we can certainly provide the aggregate information around the surveys and where, where they're happening, so you can have that information. In regards to the, the universal testing, what we're doing with our point prevalence surveys is, is very comparable to what's happening, I think you said, in uh, Maryland. So any facility, we're using data now at the Virginia Department of Health to identify facilities that would benefit, and long-term care facilities specifically, that would benefit from a point prevalence survey based on the number of cases, et cetera. We reach out to those facilities and um, essentially schedule them after some, that does take some planning. They need to be ready for what to do with the results, et cetera. Uh, but we've not turned down any requests so far. Governor, we're getting a lot of uh, phone calls, emails about uh, those on the front lines, the nurses, some of uh, maybe uh, health care providers, even law enforcement who are concerned about hazard pay or bonus pay when they look at other people who are getting uh, subsidized incomes, uh, unemployment checks. Uh, they say we're still going to work and we are on the front lines. Could anything be done for them? And then on sidebar, my second question would be for uh, Dr. Underwood, just wondering how are you, how is your department being perceived? Because it seems as though there's a climate of uh, misunderstanding about inclusion and diversity today. Just wondering how is the group being perceived with the work that you're putting forth for the state? We, two questions, and I appreciate both of them. I'm going to let our Secretary of Finance address your, your first question, and Dr. Underwood will. So, Andre, the first question was about uh, the pay for uh, overtime and different things. And it, first of all, the regulations that have been given to us by the federal authorities are, Steve, some things up to the decision of the localities in that. So if it is deemed that it is directly responsible for the COVID virus, and that is something that needs to be determined in going through there. So it's not clear cut as to whether or not these are allowed depending upon the situation. So it really depends on what's happening there and what they're responding to directly associated with the COVID-19. 
again, it goes back to directly associated with COVID-19. If the localities or whomever can prove that, then that may be an eligible expense. Otherwise, then it would not be. But it is, uh, the, the key point is whether or not it is specifically related to the virus. Thank you. I would just, uh, would just add on workers' compensation, we've had our council um, diving into this, and I've got a couple notes here that I'll read off of. And most employers and employees in Virginia are covered under the requirements of the Virginia Workers' Compensation Act, and the act specifies what is covered under the workers' compensation system and how medical benefits and wage reimbursements are afforded for temporary and permanent disabilities. Uh, workers' comp is provided in certain situations when workers are injur injured on the job or contract a job-related illness. And, um, and that presumption um, is something that is provided for in, in the Act and the Code of Virginia. So if a decision was made to provide a temporary presumption for COVID for all first responders and health providers, uh, such a policy would need to be accomplished legislatively uh, through the General Assembly rather than through an act uh, by the governor. So that is a topic that the legislature, and I suspect they will be back in Richmond later this summer, and there's a variety of issues they have um, discussed bringing up, and I think presumption um, under Workers' Compensation Act would be one they would have to act on legislatively. Thanks. This might be building off of that, but last week you said you were looking at um, all possible options to look after workers who may not feel comfortable or able to go back to work in their industry if they are going back to work because of immunocompromised organization for themselves or family members, any updates on avenues for those people who may not be able to go back to work for those reasons? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's obviously it's um, a tenuous situation with folks now being offered their positions back, and I think many workers have very valid concerns. There's a a, a protest or our education uh, adjudication process if someone does not want to come back because they think their workplace is unsafe or the the right um, uh, precautions have not been put in place. I think there will be tension with the Trump administration over how this is handled nationally. Obviously, folks are. Um, receiving unemployment, and that unemployment insurance lasts in, through August. And, um, uh, you know, the, the administration, I think, uh, has asked that states provide lists of employees who have rejected uh, coming back onto the job uh, to be kicked off of unemployment. That is one pro uh, route that would go through the federal government. We have a state process to handle claims and complaints, and I think it would be our preference to handle that at the state level. There are many valid concerns ranging from whether an employer has taken the right precautions with social distancing and PPE to whether someone now is caring for a child whose daycare is otherwise closed and they, and they can't find somewhere for their, their child to have a, a safe situation while they're at work. So it's a work in progress and it's certainly a situation uh, that we're cognizant of and, and working through. Thank you for the question. I believe the question was, how is my office being perceived? Um, I want to answer it in two ways. The governor often suggests and tells everyone that my position in my office is the first of its kind in the nation and in Virginia. And in that way, we are a national exemplar. And that's how I go around the state and even the country talking about the work that we're doing. It's very unique uh, to Virginia, but we really encourage every governor across the nation to have a position at the cabinet level that looks at diversity, equity, and inclusion. My leading the equity task force is also, I believe, perceived very positively in that um, the, the localities that we've worked with have been very excited to partner with us. For example, in the city of Harrisonburg, Mayor uh, Dina Reed uh, and I, we were working together in the task force and we were able to roll that, uh, that pilot out within a week as well as Richmond just rolling out tomorrow. And so I think that we're being perceived very positively um, and we're excited to partner with other localities. Right now, there are several localities in Northern Virginia and Hampton Roads and in uh, Southwest Virginia that say, we wanna learn more about what you're doing and how we can collaborate. And so to those localities, I say, please go to our website and take a look at what we have to offer and what we're doing and we're happy to link arms with everyone. Some people may say your department is a waste of time or a waste of money. 
Well, the governor doesn't see it that way. I don't see it the way. And I believe that I speak for the entire administration that as long as we're here, we see the value in it. And then I'd also like to suggest that we're not here to to convince everyone of the value in it, but we are really interested in linking arms with the people that want to do the most good and build momentum. And as far as I'm concerned, that's what we're doing, and that's what we'll continue to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Underwood. And I, I'd never like to correct people, but uh, I have corrected her before. Dr. Underwood told you when she first started speaking that she works for the governor. Um, just like all of these individuals up here, uh, she and they work for you. They work for Virginia. They report to me as the governor, but, but you work for Virginia, and I thank you for all that you do and all the rest of you, uh, that what you do. Um, I just wanted to, to close. Uh, uh, I know we've gone on a little bit longer today, um, but uh, Mel asked a question, uh, and I, I thought you might follow up on it as far as, you know, when we go into phase one, you know, what, what are we looking for? And, and uh, are there going to be uh, increased uh, numbers of cases out there? And, and the bottom line to that is that um, we are going into phase one because we have been following the science. We've been following the data. Uh, a lot of that, uh, those guidelines have come from the, the CDC. Um, and we have talked about those a lot. And so we feel that we're at a place where we can safely uh, go into phase one in, in most areas of Virginia. Obviously, Northern Virginia uh, is an exception. Um, but the other reason that we can go into phase one is because we have the tools now that we didn't have a month or two months ago. We, we have the tools to include more testing. As, as you've seen, we're close to 10,000 tests a day. Um, we have the tools that we're working toward better tracing. Uh, not just in, in the hot zones, but in all of Virginia. So, so I wouldn't be making the decision uh, along. I've got a lot of folks that help make these decisions, but I wouldn't make it unless we had those tools to make sure that you're safe, uh, because that's of, of utmost importance to me. And so the final thing that I would tell all of you, this is in all of our hands. Um, it's not my hands or other it's in all of our hands, and we understand now. Uh, we've been dealing with this virus for more than two months. We know how contagious it is. Uh, you've seen it doesn't discriminate. Uh, there are now cases in the White House, believe it or not. Um, so, so it's out there. Uh, as you've heard me say before, uh, as a physician, I have never seen any pathogen that, that acts like this that is as contagious as this is. So, so the message as we prepare to enter phase one, we are in a new day here in this world, not just in our country, not just in Virginia, but this virus is out there until uh, there's a cure for the virus, until there's a vaccination. Uh, we have to be cognizant. We have to be vigilant that it's, that it's out there uh, and that we have to protect ourselves. We have to protect uh, our friends, our loved ones, our neighbors, and we have to protect those are, that are on our front lines, those that you just mentioned that are working uh, in our hospitals. It's, it's in our hands, and so we need to continue with the social distancing. We need to continue staying six feet apart, washing our hands, keeping our hands uh, from our faces. All of these things, we know they work, but we have to keep doing it. So uh, you keep up the good work across Virginia. Uh, we appreciate, again, the press. Uh, I know that this is three times a week now, but it is so, so important that what we're doing, what is going on with this virus in Virginia is transmitted to Virginia so that they get accurate and updated information. And I just I thank all of you for, for being part of this team uh, and part of the solution. And we will look forward to seeing you on Wednesday. Thank you very much.